Let's just read from the top of page 45, inshallah. From the top of 45, okay. Yeah. Two point one <laughs> approaches approaches to the metacritical problem. Kant's contemporaries, Hegel, and some contemporary commentators. As we have already had occasion to point out, many of the most prominent Kant scholars of the 20th century have raised the problem of the quote possibility of the critical philosophy. Names like Henry E. Allison, Paul Geyer, Robert Pippin, W. H. Walsh, and Lewis White Beck are not insignificant ones in the world of Kant exegesis. And although they have each alluded to the seriousness and foundational nature of this problem, it remains a somewhat neglected area, perhaps because of what Pippin calls its, quote, intractability, still lacking a single large-scale treatment. Uh, long before we enter the era of the modern commentators on the first critique, however, the earliest objections to Kant's system have often pointed out the inconsistencies entailed by Kant's very assumption that the critique of reason is itself possible. While it is the supposedly, quote, dogmatic, metaphysicians, the stated targets of the first critique, who are purported to have failed to examine their own apparatuses of cognition in order to determine whether they are indeed capable of answering the questions that they have been helplessly led by, quote, reason. My dear, 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 dear Habibi Niaz, I think your the microphone's too close. Okay. It's making so that I'll, thingy, thingy. Is this, is this better? That's better. Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat that section again. Right. Long before we enter the era of the modern commentators on the first critique, however, the earliest objections to Kant's system have often pointed out the inconsistencies entailed by Kant's very assumption that the critique of, that the critique of reason is itself possible. While it is the supposedly, quote, dogmatic metaphysicians the stated targets of the first critique, who are purported to have failed to examine their own apparatuses of cognition hmm. in order to determine whether they are indeed capable of answering the questions that they have been helplessly led by, quote, reason to set for themselves, Kant does not seem to have acknowledged the necessity of accounting for how he has himself arrived at his most basic critical assumptions. The problem of the possibility of Kant's philosophy, then, is far from a new one. It began to be asked within Kant's own lifetime by thinkers like Hamann, Schultz, Plattner, and Fichte. This early stream of the reception of Kant then culminates in the work of a certain George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> so... This is a, a very old problem that was broached in Kant's own lifetime. And in fact, there were a number of philosophers in Kant's own lifetime who considered that this problem had been completely exposed and the fundamental inconsistency of Kant's philosophy had been revealed. Um, and we have to imagine, you know, there are other human beings, other philosophers working over the course of decades when Kant's also working, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so it's just, you know, it's far from, there are certain names which stand out in history, you know, obviously Kant is, is a huge one, um, but it's not the case at all that it was a smooth landing for the critique of pure reason. That's partly why he had to write a second version of it, because the you know the second edition, you know, in, in um, publications in, in editions of Kant's critique, you almost invariably have the um, the original edition and you have the new edition. They're very substantially different, and they're both usually included because there are very substantial revisions and additions, um, because. It, it just kind of, it almost fell dead from the press. No one could understand it. 
um, Kant himself acknowledged to being a very unclear writer. So he, he wrote a second edition to try to remedy that. And he also wrote his Prolegomena, um, which was a kind of mochtasar of the critique, um, which tries to be more accessible, but it's still you know, not exactly <laughs> a riveting, riveting read. Um, but so while, but this is where this paradox comes in kind of mostly, while it's the supposedly dogmatic metaphysicians, okay, now this is the definition of a dogmatic metaphysician for Kant, who are purported to have failed to examine their own apparatuses of cognition. That is what a dogmatic metaphysician is, as far as Kant's concerned. It is the failure to examine their own apparatuses of cognition. So they blithely suppose that their reason and their pure reason, as Kant would call it, is capable of taking them to these very, very lofty goals that they set for themselves. And that's what um, Kant means by dogmatic. They're not looking at the instrument itself, i.e. reason itself, to see if it's really up to the task, right? So but the problem of the possibility of Kant's philosophy is was, was asked in his own lifetime by Hamann, by Schultz, by Plattner, by Fichte. Um, and then the, 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 probably the most, well, certainly the most influential figure is Hegel, who has, a, of course, a whole host of his own problems. Um, on the other hand, Hegel is someone who's often dismissed by people who don't look at him properly. And that's also a mistake because there's um, sorry. Salam and Alaikum, my Abu Jim. Alaikum, Salam, Hassan, Nasser, Hassan. Hey, Miss Hinton, Mashuk Hajim is. I'm just in a, I, I'm just in a lesson, Molana. Okay. Can we talk later? I'm in um, at the lower campus. Okay, okay. Lower campus? Yeah. I'm, I'm in upper campus. The program is lower campus or upper campus? No, the program is upper campus. I'm just doing my metaphysics class. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought maybe. Okay, okay. okay. No, okay. no, 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 no. We'll see you soon, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Yeah, no. Um, so. This question had be begun to be asked in his own <laughs> lifetime, and the, the key figure is Hegel. And um, there's a lot of great interest in Hegel's philosophy, and we'll, we'll kind of get a hint of that. Um, you know, he's he's a very good candidate for someone whose system we can we can use certain aspects of quite extensively, as long as we, you know, do a good. There's a good purificatory process which takes place first. Um, and it's not his fundamental assumptions. No, he's, I mean, he gets it very wrong when it comes to his fundamental ontology. But in terms of some of his methods, some of his analyses, they're very, very interesting. Uh, could we go on, Merlana, 2.1.1? Yes. 2.1.1. Haman on Kantian dualisms. According to Frederick Besser, Hamann's metacritique has a strong claim to be the starting point of post-Kantian philosophy. Hamann may have been the first person to read the critique of pure reason after Kant, and quickly seeing the necessity that the process of critique be applied to Kant's critical project as well, immediately denounced Kant's abstraction of reason from, quote, its necessary embodiment in language, tradition, and experience. The idea yeah. that a distinct and freestanding, quote, faculty of reason could pronounce on the nature of things from its own independent, isolated vantage point was, for Haman, simply absurd. As Besser characterizes his position, for Haman, reason, quote, is not a faculty at all, Rather, reason is only a function, a specific way of thinking and acting in a specific cultural and linguistic context. Haman indeed takes issue with other of Kant's reifications of what are really elements of a single human consciousness. For example, 
his concretization of the sensibility and understanding as really distinct faculties, what, after all, given this separateness, allows them to interact and cooperate in the production of knowledge? Kant offers no adequate answer. Haman, then, seems to be the first thinker to question the possibility of Kant's critical project. As Besser tells us, as Besser tells us, I believe there should be an S there. No, oh, that's terrible. Uh, that's a, I've never noticed one. that type of mm -hmm. It's terrible. Just a small one. No, uh -huh. All right, so done. Uh -huh. As Besser tells us, quote, his remarks upon Kant's methodology are significant since they reveal his reaction to the implicit and often ignored <laughs> metacritical theory behind the critique. Mm. Besser's words are telling. He describes the first statement of a view that would become effectively unanimous, namely that insofar as Kant can be said to have a quote metacritical view of his own work at all, it is certainly a merely implicit account that can only be inferred by the commentator, but that is never formally stated. Mm -hmm. Moreover, in pronouncing this metacritical theory, quote, often ignored, he lends credence to the notion we have already mentioned, namely that despite its importance, the question of the possibility of Kant's project is a widely neglected one. Perhaps Haman's most important contention is that Kant has merely assumed that his modus operandi, that of, simply reflect, that of simply reflecting upon the structure of his own reason, can actually yield, can actually yield, quote, the complete system of reason as it really is. Haman's criticism of Kant is historically significant in that it identifies a philosophical trend that would become a quasi-essential proprium of the broad, quote, German idealism that was soon to emerge. As Besser tells us, this fundamentally lies in the fact that, quote, Haman's essay states one of the central goals of all post-Kantian philosophy, the search for the inner unity the common source of Kant's dualisms. Wonderful. Yeah, let's go on to the book the encounter attack because okay, pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> All right. 2.1.2. The Wolfian counterattack and questioning the need for sensible quote intuitions. A very different early metacritique of Kant came in the form of a counterattack from the Wolfian, quote, dogmatists, the object of the ire of Kant throughout the first critique. The Wolfians held that a true critique of reason would, unlike the one carried out by Kant, only serve to validate their belief in the efficacy of the traditional metaphysical method. They rejected Kant's <laughs> assumption that the real extension of our knowledge rather than the merely analytic and ultimately tautological unpacking of the meanings of words, was contingent upon the presence of a priori, and for Kant necessarily sensible, intuitions, holding instead that reason could itself yield genuine a priori results that nonetheless genuinely extend our knowledge. This is because, broadly speaking, for the Wolfians, as well as for Leibniz and numerous earlier scholastics, Principles of reason are also principles of being, not merely of human cognition. There is thus nothing to prevent them naturally applying, quote, beyond human cognition to things in themselves. The Wolfian counterattack also largely rejected Kant's account of analytic and synthetic propositions. It instead saw the truth of such propositions in terms of their determination by the governing principles of Wolfian philosophy, namely the principle of non-contradiction and the principle of sufficient reason. The former determine a priori analytic propositions and the latter a priori synthetic propositions, whereas Kant maintains that the latter can only obtain upon the synthesis of concept and intuition. 
instead of a sensible intuition being required in order to serve as the quote substratum as it were of the terms in a synthetic a priori judgment for the wolfians the determination of the validity and truth of such a judgment is effected by the mere fact that the subject of a given proposition can serve as a sufficient reason for its predicate Another line of Wolfian criticism cuts more convincingly at the very possibility of Kant's project. This line of attack is provoked by his theory that the principles of reason are true only of appearances, but not of things in themselves. As Besser characterizes this broad position, quote, it is self-refuting to maintain that the principles of logic are true only for appearances, they argue, for such a proof has to be true of us not only as appearances, but also as things in themselves. So is the statement that the principles of logic are true only for appearances itself true only of appearances, right? Is our use of the principles of logic in the proof that the principles of logic are true only for appearances also only true of appearances? Well, according to its own prescription it would have to be but in 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 conforming to its own prescription it refutes itself because that means it's not really true that the principle of logic are only true for appearances yeah that is the very proof that rational principles are true only for appearances itself employs rational principles and in order to be true must be true not merely of appearances but moreover of things in themselves this elegant reductio shows that Kant's critical method is self-defeating. In order to establish its own principles, such as the principles of logic only apply to appearances, it must invoke outside of any possible experience concepts and principles that it itself insists can only apply to possible experiences. A similar line of argument would also be taken up by the next contemporary of the critique we will examine. Molana Shekhuna, uh, Use of Chowdhury, would you be able to read the next section? Yes, sir, I can. Can you hear me and see me? I can. Okay. Um, where did, which sentence did we get up to? So we're at 2.1.3 Ernst Platner, <coughs> Schultz and Hegel, turning the critique against itself. Okay. Ernst Plattner, Schultz, and Hegel, turning the critique against itself. Ernst Plattner, whose main work was his philosophisch aphorismen, philosophical Could, could, could Benjamin aphorismen. just say that for us? Philosophisch. Philosophische aphorismen. Allah. Philosophisch Do it again. Aphorismen. Go on. <laughs> Philosophische aphorismen. Ah, it's a beautiful language. Difficult, difficult to copy. All right. Was a prominent critique, prominent early critic of Kant's new philosophy. Although hailing from a broadly Leibnizian Wolfian background, he eventually repudiated his dogmatic approach in favor of skepticism. However, this remained at the expense of Kant. For Platner, we encounter in Kant merely another form of dogmatist. This new li this line of criticism is precisely <laughs> one aimed at the question of the very possibility of the critical enterprise, because it turns the critique against itself, concluding that all the criticisms Kant makes against metaphysics apply in equal measure to his own epistemology. According to Platner, Kant's methods and arguments are just as dogmatic as those of the metaphysician. Besser sums up Platner's metacritical account of the possibility of the critical project in a way that accords with the statements of W.H. Walsh that we have already seen. Quote, Kant's negative statements about things in themselves are just as dogmatic as the positive statements of the metaphysician. The negative statement that things in themselves do not exist in space and time, for example, trespasses against Kant's limits upon knowledge. Kant is, too, is much too hasty and dogmatic in his attempt to demonstrate that all of our knowledge is limited to experience. Such a demonstration, if not carefully qualified, 
is self-refuting, for it cannot be justified through experience, end quote. Yet another contemporary criticism of Kant's failure to account for the possibility to account for the possibility of his own critical method, that of Gottlob Ernst Schultz, provides a further example of just how early on in the reception of Kant foundational inconsistencies had been widely identified in his thought. Kant set, set strict standards for the examination of the instrument of human cognition in, trend, in traditional metaphysics while conveniently exempting himself from this requirement, abstaining all the while from providing any form of justification for having done so. The central thrust of Schultz's important critique of Kant thus bears more than a passing resemblance to that of Plattner. Schultz wishes to point out that Kant's limitation of all possible knowledge to that of mere appearances enta necessarily entails that his own critical philosophy as involving claims to knowledge also be limited in the same way to appearances. Yet since Kant views his critical conclusions, such as knowledge can only be of appearances, as factual knowledge claims, he seems clearly to have, he seems clearly to have absolved his own philosophical procedure from the need for self-examination, thereby falling into the very dogmatism that is that it is his stated and celebrated raison d'etre to oppose. So note 81. So a common thread. Note 81. Thank you, Melana. See also Pippin, the persistence of subjectivity. Um, that's a book that's been recommend, recommended by Sheikh Abdul Hakim Maraj um, to the Muslim community. It's a, it came out from Cambridge Muslim, Cambridge Muslim Press. I wish it was Cambridge Muslim Press, Cambridge University Press. Uh, and it's um, um, by Robert Pippin. Now, that's actually just a collection of articles. The really important book by Robert Pippin is his Modernism as a Philosophical Problem. That is a must read. It's very short, brilliant, really worth reading. That's like 1992 or something. This one's much more recent. For others, the problem with Kant was not that he had been too skeptical about such knowledge, but that he had not been skeptical enough that he ought to have been skeptical about his own claims to be able to determine the necessary conditions of experience. There was no good reason to believe, as some such as Schultz argued, that reason was at all capable of determining con the conditions without which any knowledge would be impossible. And better to reason to believe Kant had merely catalogued the psychological workings of the mind in a way itself open to much doubt and certainty. Uh, that should be uncertainty, gosh. But finding lots of errors here, in no necessary connection with what objects, even objects of experience, must be or could not fail to be. Because, of course, Kant's claim is that this is what they must be and cannot fail to be, you know, the, the universal and necessary conditions of, of, um, of all possible cognitions, of all possible experience. So, um, so a common thread unites these various early meta-criticisms of Kant. This is the sense which we have seen in the Wolfians, Plattner and Schultz, that in, it is self-refuting for Kant to maintain that all possible knowledge involves experience, the synthesis of concept and intuition, that can only ever constitute appearance, right? Because that very statement isn't a composite, it isn't a fusion, rather, of concept and intuition. And yet it's the whole fundamental first principle. I mean, it's amongst the, the set of fundamental first principles, if you like, that Kant presupposes in order to get going with his project. Of course, he wouldn't call them first principles. Again, this is because the very claim that all possible knowledge is such itself represents a claim to knowledge which cannot possibly be verified in or derived from experience. Moreover, even were it the case per impossibile that such a proposition could be verified in experience, on Kant's own terms, it would thus be rendered no more than appearance and could not thus genuinely, and could not be thus genuinely descriptive of the way things really are. So how does this tie into Nafid Ahmed? Well, Kant believes, of course, and we'll see this very explicitly, that his 
his philosophy is true. Right? It, it corresponds to Nafs al-Amr. Um, it's true in Nafs al-Amr. And yet the whole purport of his philosophy is to discount the possibility of the type of knowledge that he's putting forward about Nafs al-Amr. So don't be surprised we're in the mess that we're in today. Right? Including people denying the influence of Kant. Um, I think they've got Stockholm syndrome or something. Perhaps the most famous metacritical objection to Kant of them all finds its locus classicus in Hegel's logic. It bears a close resemblance to the major criticism of the Wolfians that in formulating his critical conclusions, Kant cannot help but employ the self same rational principles he will go on to conclude only apply to appearances. In Hegel's formulation, this becomes the more general observation that it is a stark absurdity to attempt to subject the ability of human cognition to produce truth to a critique, when that critique can only be carried out from within human cognition. In Hegel's words, could you read this, uh, Benjamin, please? A main line of argument in the critical philosophy tells us, first of all, to examine the faculty of, co of cognition and see whether it is equal to such an effort. We ought, says Kant, to become acquainted with the instrument before we undertake the work for which it is to be employed. <clears throat> but yeah. if the instrument is insufficient, all our trouble will be spent in vain. But the examination of knowledge can only be carried out by an act of knowledge. To examine this so-called instrument is, is the same thing as to know it. But to seek to know before we know is, an, is as absurd as the wise re resolution of Scholasticus, not to venture into the water until he had learned to swim. But to seek to know before we know is as absurd as the wise resolution of Scholasticus not to venture into the water until he had learned to swim. He said, I'm not going to go into the water until I've learned to swim. Impossible. You must think I'm an idiot. You think I'm going to go in the water before I know how to swim? Not going to happen. Um, so that's what Hegel's saying. Now, I would say that that's pretty devastating. Now, the only thing is, the, the problem with that is that as, an, as, a, as a total and final answer, is that it doesn't take into account the possibility the, that Kant's account of human cognition is actually a highly reductive and limitary account. Why? Because for one thing, he rejects the possibility of intellectual intuition. That's one of the cornerstones of his philosophy. Now, of course, intellectual intuition is something we've discussed to some degree already, but that's a, a fundamental component of a number of different philosophical systems. Um, and if you look at the critique of reason, um, I think it's fair to call it, uh, of someone like Saruddin al Qunui. Um, you'll find that the reason that they are able to subject a critique of reason, they're, 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 they're able to subject human cognition to a critique is because they're doing, they're doing so from the vantage point of a higher faculty, right? So if, human, if the human faculties of cognition are ordered in a hierarchy, it should certainly be possible for one level to do a critique of another. So, you know, reason can do a critique of the knowledge of the senses, for example, right? Reason can do a critique of the knowledge of the senses. So perhaps the spirit can do a critique of the knowledge of reason, right? And that is when, you know, inshallah, we get to Saruddin al Qunui's critique of reason. And when you see it, you'll think it's pretty justified to call it a critique of reason. Um, <coughs> that's exactly what it is. Um, he's doing so from the vantage point of a higher form of cognition. You could say it's a higher form of reason. It's a higher form of um, uh, awareness, 
right? But there's the, the understanding as Sheikh al Akbar uh, also is a, it's a recurrent theme in his work that the results of cash can correct the results of reason, right? And he has that opening section, extraordinary section of the Futuhat, where he does this tahqiq of all of these masail and alim al-kalam and al-falsaf and things. Um, again, it's not pronouncing upon something on the basis of just this flight of, of mystical ecstasy. It's this total cognition that takes into account all of these different types of awareness, including the, on the rational level, because he, us, he uses rational arguments there as well. So um, yeah, so just to go on. Um, now this is, the next section is, is about the way in which there are certain thinkers today who try to come to Kant's aid um, and say, well, maybe it's not so catastrophic after all, but the only way that they can achieve that is by making Kant into a pragmatist, which I think it's fair to say, as we'll see, that Kant would have been utterly horrified by. Um, so uh, could we read on Molan and Yes, if you don't mind? Definitely. And uh, just quickly intervene if I... The microphone Please. becomes too close. Okay. Oh, quickly intervene if it becomes too close. Yeah, it's just that it makes a crackling sound. But oh. Yep. Okay. 2.1.4. Kant in the raiment of his pragmatist progeny. Contemporary approaches to the metacritical problem. We have already noted that earlier critiques of the critique have tended to identify difficulties pertaining to the broad, quote, metacritical rubric of the possibility of the critical project, and to conclude that these difficulties amount to straightforward contradictions, which formally rule out the possibility that the procedure and main aims and conclusions of the first critique could even, in principle, be fully consistent. Several much more recent commentators, however, such as Walsh, Beck and Rescher share in something different. They attempt to defend Kant mm -hmm. simply by proposing that the status of his critical principles be downgraded in a manner which it is scarcely possible to think would have been acceptable to Kant himself. Walsh attempts to cast Kant's critical principles as mere records of the apparently, quote, universal and necessary features of repeated everyday human experience, but acknowledges that this would imply, contrary to Kant's emphatic statements as to their necessity, which we are about to see, that the same principles are ultimately contingent, because in principle at least, an unexpected human experience could yield entirely different results. Beck inclines to an attempt to treat the problem by subordinating the claims of the first critique to the practical requirements of the second critique. <laughs> Similarly, Rescher would have us believe that Kant's critical principles should be seen as fundamentally pragmatic in nature, in being ultimately subordinated to the merely practical aim of creating an ordered rational system. Lewis Whitebeck's often excellent article toward a metacritique of pure reason is perhaps the most well-known amongst the vanishingly small number of writings that take the problem of the possibility of Kant's first critique as their specific focus. Beck begins by unambiguously stating that the identity of, quote, the genuine method of the critique of pure reason remains a point of dispute to the present day. This is because many of Kant's foundational starting points, like his notion that the only form of intuition the direct cognition of particulars, the direct cognition of particulars is sensible intuition, seems strictly speaking to be nothing more than assumptions. As Beck tells us, quote, no proof of that is attempted anywhere in the critique of pure reason. Mm -hmm. 
and is in fact denied by many other philosophers. Not only is it not proved, it is not even a well-formed judgment under the rubrics allowed in the critique, for it is neither analytic nor a posteriori, and if it is synthetic yet known a priori, none of the arguments so painfully mounted in the critique to show that such knowledge is possible has anything to do with how we know this, if indeed we do know it. Here seems to be a contingent fact, contingent because a nonsensible intuition is consistently conceivable, mm -hmm. yet unlike other contingent facts, not discovered by anything comparable to observations by which we know the contingent fact that men with two eyes are better at seeing depth than men with one eye. Such judgments are brutally factual, yet in some not well-defined sense, self-evident. They are factual, but not empirical. Mm. When Beck refers to this, quote, brute factuality, he means, quote, Kant repeatedly admits that he cannot tell why there are only two forms of human intuition and why our intuition is sensible and our understanding discursive, end quote. The passage from the first critique Beck cites is B145, 146, in which Kant admits that, quote, for the peculiarity of our understanding, so the, the particular nature of the understanding, a fur, as in the faculty of the understanding, the categories, a further ground may be offered just as little as one can be offered for why we have precisely these and no other functions for judgment, or why space and time are the sole forms of our possible intuition, end quote. It is because of examples of stark statements from Kant like this one, which seem to suggest that many of his most important principles lack meaningful evidence, that Beck calls for a metacritique of pure reason in order to investigate, quote, the nature and justification, if there can be one, of the knowledge claims used in the critique of pure reason, end quote. So Lewis White Beck is one of the most prominent scholars of Kant of the 20th century. Yet Beck also admits that because of the absence of clear solutions in Kant's own work, providing such a meta critique is no easy task. Beck does, however, commit to the attempt to begin to provide a, quote, possible approach to its solution. Beck then wishes to find a way of determining whether the presuppositions of the critique are true or not. Yet finds himself faced with the profound difficulty that the limits on knowledge, which Kant himself sets, pose to the possibility of determining the truth of those very presuppositions. Kant has limited knowledge to experience, that is, in its barest essentials, the synthesis of concept and intuition. But he has only limited knowledge in this way due to presuppositions which, because they do not constitute syntheses, they do not, his presuppositions do not constitute syntheses of concepts and intuitions, can paradoxically never constitute knowledge according to his own requirements. In Beck's memorable words, the critique thus, quote, seems to be suspended from nothing in heaven and supported by nothing on earth, end quote. And then I put in the footnote, the same can be said with equal or greater justice of most of those children of Kant, the contemporary schools of analytic and continental philosophy. Yet the solution that Beck has sketchily outlined and which he acknowledges is similar to that put forward by Walsh in philosophy and psychology and Kant's critique in involving a demythologizing of Kant seeks to make the critical process of determining the nature of the operations and faculties of our minds a matter merely of discovering the contingent appearances of our intellectual abilities, which ultimately only means what they seem like to Kant. This is a quasi-inductive process of trial and error rather than the attempt to determine the ontological statuses of actual faculty, faculties and of their relationship with being as it is beyond our faculties, and indeed of ascertaining whether Kant's statements about their epistemological productivity are noumenal or merely phenomenal claims. For Beck then, Kant's assertions about the nature of our faculties and the resultant limitation placed on knowledge are yielded and justified only by the supposed fact that these are the faculties we just happen to find in ordinary experience. We do not come to know them by possessing some form of access to a trans-empirical intelligible realm, which would require the nonsensical intuition which Kant's system precludes, but rather by simply experiencing our own intellectual abilities almost phenomenologically, no, no wonder phenomen phenomenology comes directly from Kant, and inferring that the best way to account for them is by positing the faculties of sensibility, understanding, and reason, 
the vast inadequacy of Beck's attempt in an apology on Kant's behalf, despite his helpful depiction of the problem itself, arises from the fact that the only possible way that one can determine the truth or otherwise of non-empirical statements about empirical particulars, such as that, that they represent mere appearances rather than numeral entities, or that they are necessarily constituted by concepts and intuitions, would be to do so from a vantage point that is non-empirical. If we possess no prior epistemological space in which it is possible to verify true but non-empirical statements, the statement that only syntheses of sensibility and understanding experience can be productive of knowledge is simply not known to be true. It may well be, at least we can say so for the sake of argument, that faculties resembling sensibility and understanding as depicted by Kant are indeed just the fundamental faculties which we would each of us as individual human beings find or equipped with if only we looked carefully enough. But the jump from this notion to one that entails, for example, that knowledge can decisively, decisively, decisively only ever be of appearances and that there is no faculty of nonsensible intuition simply cannot be justified on Kant's own terms. And yet with, without these assumptions, the most important conclusions of Kant's theoretical philosophy collapse like a house of cards. Beck concedes that, quote, we cannot show, as Kant repeated, repeatedly confesses, why they must be so and not otherwise, yet nonetheless believes that Kant has, quote, good reasons for thinking that our faculties are, constitu are constituted and our knowledge limited in the ways that he claims. Yet most perplexingly, the good reasons that Beck cites simply involve the very Kantian assumptions that in a metacritique we are trying to account for and cannot thus simply assume. For example, a good reason for affirming the limitedness of knowledge to experiences defined by Kant is meant to be represented by the fact that this limitedness makes room for genuine faith by denying us actual knowledge of the existence of God. Because if we could actually know that God existed for certain, actions conforming to the moral law would be performed out of fear rather than hope or duty, right? <laughs> it's one of Kant's, you know, the guiding principles of his practical philosophy. You know, I had to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Otherwise, everyone would only act. If they had knowledge of God, they'd only act. I mean, it was absurd. Anyway, number 93. What about being performed out of wonder, the beauty of the signs of God and his hierarchy of being, and at the beauty of soul that is bestowed, bestowed upon the one who conforms to the moral law? Yet the metacritical question is how we know that knowledge is actually thus limited. Any answer which replies that if knowledge were thus limited, we would be more hopeful and dutiful than fearful merely attempts to rescue Kant's already highly vulnerable theoretical assumptions by subordinating them to his practical assumptions, which it is eminently arguable are even more tenuous. Most crucially, this is a far cry from what Kant himself claims. Indeed, this, this type of strategy faces the problem of, uh, of the existence of Kant's own repeated claims that his critical principles are factual and absolutely <laughs> certain. We have already seen Kant's very late statement concerning the first critiques quote, fully secured foundation established forever, end quote. The critique itself contains numerous unequivocal statements affirming that the principles of the critique are certain and indeed necessary. As he tells us in the preface to the first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, quote, as far as certainty is concerned, I have myself pronounced the judgment that in this type of inquiry, it is in no way allowed to hold opinions. For every cognition that is supposed to be certain a priori proclaims that it, that it wants to be held for absolutely necessary and even more, is this true of a determination of all pure cognitions a priori, which is to be the standard and thus even the example of all apodictic certainty, end quote. In his commentary on the critique, A.C. Ewing characterizes this passage as, quote, Kant's audacious claim to completeness and certainty for his philosophy, a claim which he never withdraws, end quote. It is notable that in this passage, Kant claims a unique status for his own critical philosophy, charged with the, quote, determination of pure cognitions a priori, which is not only an example of necessity and certainty, but the standard thereof. A similar claim emerges in the transcendental aesthetic concerning Kant's views on the necessary, on the necessary ideality of time and space, which he asserts in grounds the radical transcendental idealism that he promotes. An important concern, he tells us, of our transcendental aesthetic is that it, it not merely earns some favor as a plausible hypothesis, but that it be as certain and indubitable and dubitable as can ever be demanded of a theory that is to serve as an organon. It seems unlikely then that Kant would appreciate charitable interpretations of his work, claiming that the conclusions of his transcendental idealism merely represent contingent features of ordinary human experience. 
Alhamdulillah. So we're up to the end of 58 there. So uh, we're in 1.66. Um, I'll just read a tiny little passage. I, I recommend, by the way, everyone, everyone, that you get hold of this uh, very good commentary, Caligas. Um, I don't actually have all my books with me. They're all on the ship, literally, inshallah. Well, uh, this is Plotinus, um, Stephen McKenna. This is actually a really nice edition. Zaytuna ordered this for me because I had a preceptorial, I have a preceptorial on it. But um, I'm just going to read very quickly. <coughs> hmm? Uh, it's a preceptorial that m mostly is with sophomores. Is that year two, sophomore? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're just going to do one six. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the things we're reading. Otherwise, we're reading Republic book six and reading something else by Plato. Um, hence, the soul heightened to the intellectual principle is beautiful to all its power. For intellection and all that proceeds from intellection are the soul's beauty. A graciousness native to it, not foreign, for only with these is it truly soul. And it is just to say that in the soul's becoming a good and beautiful thing is its becoming like to God. For from the divine comes all the beauty and all the good in beings. So if you look at the way that Sayyid Sharif al Jajani defines. Um, um, philosophy in his Tarifat. It's very much in accordance with the Platonic definition of philosophy. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that <coughs> um, at some point, inshallah. Um, we may, may we may even say that beauty is the authentic existence right and ugliness is the principal contrary to existence and ugly is also the primal evil right which is matter for the Plotinus. um and again when people say oh Plotinus, you know doesn't like the physical world he says that matter is evil they, it's not there's a really it's a bad mess it's a bad misrepresentation of what's going on there what he's saying is insofar as we call something evil it's because it's the furthest thing in terms of the scheme of creation from the from the good because it's the the last phase of the unfolding of 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 being in in the in the the the, the um you know, the badihi sense of being not as a technical term because the being as a technical term in their philosophy means substance, which is the world of forms. Don't, for, don't forget, in um, uh, Platonism, substance is the world of forms, and it's specifically the web woven by the, the five magister gene, the five su supreme genera, right? So so for something to qualify as a substance, it has to be characterized by the five magistagene, right? So that's very different to the, um, that's why the, the one is simply beyond substance, um, because the word being means the world of form. So the point is, God is beyond the world of form. That's what they mean by it. Um, and for Aristotle, substance obviously doesn't mean that that's why um plotinus calls aristotle substance legomeni usia so-called substance counterfeit substance as in it's not really substance right um so that's uh, very simply what's intended by that so uh, matter is the furthest thing from real being and because beauty 
the, the realm of um, the forms is the realm of the platonic transcendentals where everything is characterized by truth, beauty, and goodness, that which is at the furthest, like matter is the, is the stage of the fusion of being in that, in that very general sense, um, where, um, it, it, <laughs> where it's no longer productive. So matter is the first stage, which is no longer productive. It doesn't produce anything after it's aqim, right? And so because it's the furthest thing from the world of forms, which is truth, beauty, and goodness, it's also considered evil in that sense. You see, it's a kind of logical necessity. That's what evil would mean then. Not that, oh, he says that the world of uh, uh, corporeality is evil in that sense. So he's kind of this negativist about real life type of thing. That's just a misunderstanding. So... Um, so we may even say that beauty is the authentic existent, existence, that's the world of forms, and ugliness is the principle contrary to existence, right? I don't think existence means the world of forms, and the ugly is also the primal evil. Therefore, its con contrary is at once good and beautiful, or is good and beauty, and hence the one method will discover to us the beauty good and the ugliness evil. Right? So we have a very quick look in <clears throat> Caligus, page 206. He's commenting on 621 to 32, but he has a little hierarchy of the, um, of the beautiful, right? Um, That's the, can you see it the right way around? That's his hierarchy. Um, so it's, it's beautiful. Sorry, Sorry, I, did, I, I did post, um, I posted that one in the uh, reading list, uh, the, the commentaries, if, if people want to see it there, in case. It's in the, uh, where is it? The drive. Who's that speaking? Oh, hello, it's me, sir. Khaled Williams. Khaled Williams, Sheikh and Elena. It's very kind of you, Elena. Uh, just, uh, just a note. Um, it's in the. Uh, where is it? Uh, am I allowed to post links on this in the chat here? That'd be easier than holding <laughs> the book up to the page. What's my Elena? Uh, where is it? Greek philosopher. There it is. So if I post this in the group, will people be able to see it? I have no idea. Oh, wait, I'm on the wrong computer. That's no good. Um... Excellent. Thank you, Melana. So, um, yeah, so it's just that you, you have the beauty itself, which is identified with the good. Then there's simply an, an ambiguity. Well, you, would you say it's beyond beauty? There are some Platonists who would. Again, what do you mean by that? You mean it, it surpasses any knowable determination. Yeah, baby. <laughs> it surpasses any knowable determination of beauty, but it is beautiful. It's, it's beauty, but it just surpasses any finite knowable determination thereof. That's what it means by saying beyond. Okay. Uh, beauty, the good, the beautiful intellect, as in the beautiful thing, soul, psychical beautiness. So at the level of the good of the one, beauty itself. At the level of intellect, the beautiful, as in the beautiful thing. At the level of soul, psychical beautiness, like, uh, i.e. the virtues, right? Sense, at the level of sensibles, beautiful bodies, it says, actions, etc., and the level of matter, the ugly, right? Okay, so beauty itself, the level of the good and the one. The level of the intellect, which is what, what's the level of the intellect? What's the level of the intellect? The level of the intellect is the beautiful, exactly, which is the level of the form. So the level of the intellect is the level of 
capital B being and the forms. So the forms, capital B being, in capital I intellect, all the same thing. At that level, it's the beautiful thing in itself. At the level of soul, it's psychical beaut beautifulness, i.e. the virtues, right? The beautiful virtues of character, etc. At the level of sensibles, it says beautiful bodies and actions, etc. And the level of matter, that's where we get this thing called ugliness arising. Because it's the furthest thing from the beautiful itself. But, uh, let's all keep one another in our prayers. Hope to see you soon, inshallah. Salam alaikum. Take care. Salam alaikum, Salam alaikum,